listening to the 40 Thrive Podcast, the show created for women 40 and beyond, ready to shake things up. And now, your host, Jackie McDougal. Well, hello there. Welcome back to 40 Thrive. I'm psyched that you are here. While I have your attention, do not forget to hit that subscribe, favorite, follow button wherever you're listening to this. That way you can get notified when the next 40 Thrive episode is up. You never have to go searching for it. It is a win-win. So on today's show, we're talking relationships. I have to say I'm really excited for this conversation. Let me tell you why. I got a pitch a little while back about this woman who helps you fix your relationship even without the guy's conscious effort. Yeah, I'm going to let you sit with that for a second. I was like, what the heck is going on? Oh, is this one of those things where women have to do all the work? That's always happening. Why do we have to do the work? Why do we have to fix the marriage or the relationship or whatever's going on? Like I was digging my heels in. I was getting myself all riled up. And then I thought, you know what? I got to look into this a little bit more. That is one thing I am trying since turning 50 is to not just react and decide how I feel without actually taking a breath, sleeping on it, doing some research, whatever it takes to actually stop and receive the information. So you are in for a real treat today because I did all that and then I invited her on to discuss it. And I have to say, it opened my eyes in a lot of ways, this conversation. I look at my marriage a little bit differently. I realize that maybe I don't have to tell him my opinion every second I have one. And yes, he edits the show. I'm sorry, honey. You know, whether you are with the person of your dreams or things aren't going so well, there are some serious tangible tips here that can help you in your relationship. Laura Doyle is a New York Times bestselling author who was really struggling in her marriage and feeling really desperate. So she reached out and asked happily married women for their secrets. The only guideline was that they had to be married for 15 years or more. And that's when she says she got her quote unquote miracle and kind of accidentally started a worldwide movement. You can get any and all of her books right here in the show notes or at 40thrive.com forward slash episode 105. In fact, you can check out books from all past 40 Thrive guests. I've created you a little personal development bookstore for easy one-stop shopping. That's all in the show notes at 40thrive.com forward slash episode 105. Or if you're an audiobook fan like myself, you can actually get a free audiobook download for free. Did I mention free? With a free trial of Audible. You can access the Audible Plus catalog with unlimited listening to select audiobooks, Audible originals, podcasts, so much more. Every month you get a credit good for any title in their entire premium selection, totally yours to keep, and there are no commitments. My favorite part, you can cancel your membership at any time. All titles purchased with a credit are yours to keep forever. So check it out for one month for free and see what the fuss is all about. You have absolutely nothing to lose except for maybe your excuse for not reading anymore. So check out audibletrial.com forward slash 40 thrive. It's audibletrial.com forward slash 40 thrive. By the way, Laura is also host of the Empowered Wife podcast. So check that out. And she's appeared on the Today Show, Good Morning America and The View. But really, I have to say again, it's this part that caught my attention. She's helped over 15,000 women fix their relationships, even the hopeless ones, without their husband's effort. Um, what? You know I had to dive into this. I just had to know. So check out my conversation with Laura Doyle. Laura, welcome to 40 Thrive. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I've been diving into all the things that you're doing, and I don't think there could be a better time to discuss marriage (laughs) and partnership. So you work with women mostly, yes? Exclusively. Exclusively with women. Yes. And are all of the women that you work with, are they cisgender women in heterosexual relationships? We've had everybody come through. Mostly, yes, that is correct. But I've had lesbians study the intimacy skills with us. 
And I can only think of one transgender woman uh, that has come through, but I think it sort of speaks to the universality of this desire to feel desired and cherished and feel special and taken care of in our intimate relationships. I mean, everyone deserves to have that. Absolutely. Yeah. I just want to say up front, so when we talk today, there are probably a lot of discussion using heterosexual cisgender relationships, but it can translate to any relationship that you are in if you are listening to this right now. Yeah, that's a great way to explain it. So take us back a little bit. How did you first get into this work? Yeah, well, I was the perfect wife. And then I got married. And so that, <laughs> that went out the window. <laughs> so, but right? I thought I was doing great. I was just going to help my husband be a little more ambitious and tidier. And I was going to tell him how to be more romantic. And for some reason, he started avoiding me. He didn't want to be around me. And I just thought there is something wrong with this man. All he does is watch TV. He doesn't want to spend any time with me. He wasn't even interested in making love to me. So I knew there was something wrong with him. And I thought, well, I'll just take him to marriage counseling. And then the counselor will fix him then I can finally be happy because I think mm. that's how it works. Right. So, <laughs> but I was on the marriage counselor's gray couch when I realized this is hopeless. He's never going to change. I'm either going to spend the rest of my life in a loveless marriage or I have to get divorced. So I decided I would get divorced. And the only problem was I was too embarrassed to get divorced because people had been to the wedding just not that many years before, six, seven, eight years before. And so as a last ditch effort, I decided to ask women who had been married for at least 15 years and seemed like they had happy marriages for their advice, their secrets, you know, how, right, how are right. you doing this? Cause I'm never going to make it that long. And, and the things they said, gosh, they just didn't even make sense to me. I didn't even understand what they were saying. I thought they were going to say, you have to marry the right person, but they didn't say that. I remember one woman said, you know, I try never to criticize my husband, no matter how much it seems like he deserves it. And I was <laughs> like, have you got anything else? Because <laughs> I don't see how I'm going to do that. Like, is that even possible? Right. But I was so desperate. I really did very badly want to have a good marriage. I did. Yeah. So I decided to just experiment with their suggestions. I had nothing to lose. There was just at my house, wall to wall hostility. We had cold wars where we didn't speak for days. Hmm. So I started experimenting with these ideas. Where did you start? Where there are two things I started with. One was trying to relinquish inappropriate control of my husband, right? It'd been kind of all about telling him what to do and how to do it. And I decided that instead of doing that, I was going to, I had, it sounds awful, but I had this imaginary duct tape and I just put it over my mouth. And when I thought <laughs> I'm really tempted to tell him what to eat for lunch, that would be way better than a candy bar right now. Instead, I would just, I would imagine my duct tape and I would not comment. Mm. And for a while, Jackie, I felt like a mute. And it was really just a reflection of how much I had been focused on what he was doing and commenting on it all the time. Yeah. And so the sad piece about this, two sad pieces, one is I had become a porcupine wife because helpful in wife language is controlling and critical in husband language. So he was avoiding me because I was so critical all the time. And then the other tragic thing that I didn't fully understand until I really made this a practice to relinquish inappropriate control was my life was going by like a car going down the street with no one at the wheel. And then I was also trying to make myself a lot happier because I had been pretty miserable, pretty resentful. Let's like sugarcoat it. I was kind of a shrew, right? Most of the time because I was doing everything and he wasn't yeah. doing the right thing. Yeah. And that's very common. It's very common. And it's such a lonely place to live. I didn't like it either. I yeah. didn't appreciate sounding like my mother on her worst day every day, pretty much. Right. So when I gave up those two things, relinquishing inappropriate control and really trying to make myself happy. So I came through the door one time and his face lit up. He was happy to see me again. Hmm. And that had been gone. So I thought, okay, I'm on to something. There's something here. And there were a few other things that I was, I was trying to do. And honestly, it was like in fits and starts. It wasn't that it was so hard to do the things. There weren't hard things to do. They're just, they were just new, like they were just new habits. And I had these old habits of just complaining and being miserable and pointing at what was wrong. Why do you think we do that real quick? I know a lot of women that I talk to in my community are a little over it. 
<laughs> they're raising the kids mostly. They're paying the bills, prepping the taxes, social calendar. Right. Maintaining the cars and yeah. Everything. Like, and yeah. so when you find yourself just being over it and, and maybe complaining and feeling lonely and all of these things, why do you think it manifests as this like control over everything he's doing? Well, I was super curious. About that. Here's the one thing I did get from the marriage counseling, right? Which we went for years and we paid like $9,000 and this is over 20 years ago. So it was a lot of money, a lot of time. Yeah. One big valuable piece I got was um, I remember saying like, I don't know if you realize you're, you're kind of controlling. And I was like, <laughs> like the records, like, rrr, rrr, you know, like what? <laughs> we are here to fix him. Right. Please, let's stay focused people. And what I didn't realize was that underneath that urge to control everything, like how the bills were paid, you know, how, how he was spending money, everything was fear. Yes. You know, yeah. if you're not afraid that you're going to have to wait longer or pay more or be lonely, it, you don't have to try to control things. And so what I got to find out about myself was I was very fear motivated. Everything was coming from fear. I didn't want to be that woman who's just fearful all the time. Mm -hmm. I really want to be a woman of faith who feels confident and optimistic and trusts other people. But those weren't skills that I had cultivated. It wasn't anything I'd had modeled for me. My parents are divorced. So I was following a failed recipe. I was doing exactly what I saw dear old mom doing. And I was heading for the same outcome. Yeah. So I, I, and I just think that is a big part of it. I think a lot of us, either we come from broken homes or we come from marriages that aren't the kind of marriage that you'd want to have when you grow up. There was no relationships 101 at my schools. I don't know if there was at yours, right? <laughs> no. But I was just thinking about like driver's ed, right? You have to like take the class, you got to study for the test. You got to take behind the wheel training. And then, and only then do we give you a license. We wouldn't say like, Hey, you love this car? Here's the keys. Just drive around, see how it right. goes, right? Be dangerous and scary. And you'd say, probably, you know, not for me almost, right? Like I'm I want out of this after yeah. you crash a couple of times. So I think a lot of women, you know, for me, if you were raised this way too, right? We can do anything and you got to get your education. You don't want to have to depend on a man. So we're taught a lot about how to be successful in our careers, but I think it's uh, kind of tragic. It was for me to have no knowledge of how to be successful in my relationship, no training, no preparation for that. I was successful in my career, more or less, but it mm -hmm. didn't feel like a successful life because so much of my energy was being stolen in the form of needless emotional turmoil about my failing relationship that I was living in day in and day out. Yeah. And I think there's so many messages, especially I would say Gen X, because I think that's when we're going from like the June Cleaver at the door, you know, with the, the cocktail and <laughs> the paper in the morning and that whole life to like, I can do it myself. I mean, I am definitely that person. I didn't get married until I was 31. My whole 20s, you know, was me independent, buying my own home, doing things. And so I think there still is a level of, and this is 18 years later, a still a level of like, don't tell me, I, I know how to do this. Absolutely. I think that we've lost, at least I'll speak for myself, a little bit of softness. This programming is there that it's like, we are badass women all the time. We can have it all. And then you forget to like, come home and cuddle up and allow yourself to be vulnerable. You know, that is beautifully said, Jackie. I love how you just expressed that because isn't that valuable too, right? That softness. I, I remember before we met, my husband dated a, a third grade teacher. So she was with eight-year-olds all day. And he said when she got off work, she was still saying things like, you know, go sit down, put that away. And it was like <laughs> such a turn off, right? Do you like, have to go potty? Right. No. <laughs> exactly. He's like, so he broke up with her. And it's kind of understandable. She didn't, she didn't know how to change her hat. And, it, and while it's true that, of course, we're capable and competent at work, I like the way Connie Schultz puts it. Before I would let my husband make me a cup of coffee, I wanted to make sure it wasn't going to interfere with my rights to own property or vote. <laughs> so I think we do kind of conflate these things like yeah. if I'm going to receive special treatment or being told I'm beautiful or him going to get the car when it's raining or giving me his jacket because he's cold, right? If I'm going to, is that going to hurt my ability to be this independent woman, you know, that was really held up as like kind of a big thing that we all wanted to achieve. Right. And having gotten there, it's like, yeah. And I also still 
want to hold hands and I want to be told I'm beautiful and wonderful and have my marriage be my soft place to land. Right. I love that. I have to tell you, when I first started diving into what you do, I was sort of expecting like a new iteration of, remember the rules? Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. Treat your man this way and put your needs last. And you know what? This community is a group of women who've been putting themselves last for way too many years that I'm not going back, (laughs) you know? No. But what I noticed when you actually dive into what you're saying, you're like, self-care, take care of yourself. Like your relationship could actually be better when you focus on your own needs as women. And I'm like, okay, now I'm listening. I'm listening, Laura. (laughs) (laughs) Right? So I I have to ask, you've helped 15,000 women fix their relationships, even the hopeless ones, without their husband's effort. And this is why I was like, I know I need to talk to her because I'm having this visceral reaction. (laughs) Everything in me was like, why should we do all the work without him making effort? Why should it be on us again? Everything else is on us. So Exactly. But that's not what you're necessarily saying. I mean, your point is so valid. I felt the same way. Like I had done everything. I had read every book. I had gotten counseling. I, I I had done all I I knew I was a good wife, right? And it was like I was doing the wrong work. <laughs> that is the problem. Right. And I think a lot of us have done the wrong work. And so we have this impression like it's so exhausting to fix the relationship and really the you know, the joke's been on me because what I had to do to make my relationship, the shiny, amazing relationship I have now was exactly what you say. It was like, take care of Laura. It was this journey, this personal development of learning that what I focus on increases and making myself happy and deciding to be the goddess of fun and light instead of the, you know, the goddess of Wikipedia who knows all and tells everybody what they should be doing. Right. So I may, may relate to that. <laughs> right? I mean, she's really smart. So. Yeah. And I love to feel smart and there's just no aspect of this that is like dumbing down or being less than who I am, but there is an aspect of acknowledging that I'm a mere mortal woman. And some days I'm overwhelmed. And some days I don't know what to do with a challenge in my business or with my sister. And then it can take like my husband and three best friends to set me right again. And that's okay. You know, that's like, I really kind of love the idea that I can be, it's a vulnerability, but I call it being the accountable mess, right? Mm. So when I've got shooting tears and snot coming out of my face, it doesn't make me less attractive. It actually can make me more attractive as long as it's accountable and not blamey tears, Mm. right? There's a big distinction there. I just remember one time I was watching the King's speech at home in the dark by myself, my husband's out. He's going to be out for a while Well, he comes home and I have this exact situation I'm describing and the lights are off and he says, hello. And I'm thinking, if I just don't answer, he won't know that I'm this mess. I don't want him to see that. Mm -hmm. And of course that lasted for, you know, a millisecond. And then (laughs) he realized something was wrong and just came in so quick to comfort, to hug, to give me his love. Mm -hmm. And now that I've experienced that so many more times, it's, just an indescribable, wonderful feeling I don't want to live without. So I actually strive to get to that vulnerability. It doesn't mean he has to rescue me from the bottom of a well every day, but it doesn't matter. Things happen. I love that you mentioned earlier that it stems from fear, right? And so sometimes when we're feeling emotions, they can come out as controlling and aggressive and all of that, or it can come out as vulnerable. You know, when I'm vulnerable and ask him for what I need and to help me, He's all over it, but not once in our 18 years of marriage has my trying to control a circumstance out of fear, even though it's out of the same feeling, it's never been effective. And yet here I am still trying it. (laughs) Me too, right? (laughs) It's still once in a while will come up, but you're such a natural Jackie. Like you're so wise. This 18 years of marriage, you were married more than 15 years, right? So I would Mm -hmm, have asked mm -hmm. you. Well, I have to say he is the best and not just because he edits this podcast, but <laughs> anyway, he might hear what we're saying. But he he is the kindest. I, I will say no matter what happens, I, I know that he always has my heart in mind first and foremost. And that makes a huge difference because I know a lot of people where that's not the case. And so to try to quote unquote fix something when you don't feel valued, I mean, that's what you're talking about with your work. A lot of these women are not feeling valued. And so you're not feeling valued in your relationship. 
he's not necessarily looking to do the work. How do you fix something without his permission? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Without him, you know, here, read this book or let's go to this counselor. Yeah. Right. And so first of all, I just have to say, I give you all the credit for giving him all the credit for like, you can see that he wants to be your hero, but that's actually something that I can see is about you. Now that I've mm -hmm. done this work for 20 years with so many thousands of women, you're actually doing a great job focusing on the experience you want to have, which mm -hmm. is that you can trigger his hero gene by asking for help. And that when you, and then when you're controlling and fearful, you're not getting a good response. It's just so wise, but yeah. So without his permission, without his, him signing on to something or agreeing to a lot of women that arrive on our campus are there because there's an absolute crisis. Like he said, he doesn't love her anymore mm -hmm. or he wants to divorce or separate. And so it's beyond him not giving permission. He's out the door. He's already given up. And what we find is that I think it kind of goes back to what we all learned from Spider-Man, which is with great power comes great responsibility. And we as women have this amazing power to influence our relationships, to create the culture we want to have. You know, I found I could create wall-to-wall -wall hostility if I wanted it, or I could make things playful and passionate depending on how I showed up. It kind of mm -hmm. goes back to that adage, you know, mama's not happy. No one's happy. Right. There are certain practices that lead to becoming an irresistible magnet. And really I've asked thousands of husbands um, and boyfriends, even I'll say, how important is it to you that your wife is happy or your girlfriend is happy? And do you know, they all said the same thing. They said either, oh, that's everything, or it's the most important thing in the UK. They say it's imperative. Mm. So you got to ask yourself, like, is my man really so different or is he feeling so unsuccessful at making me happy? I know for me, I just wasn't very pleasable no matter what he tried to do. Yeah. Or I was unwittingly creating a defensive response because of my lack of knowledge of what respect looked like. I knew I should be respectful, but I had no idea what that meant. Mm. And unfortunately, I wasn't a very respectful wife. And what does that mean to you? Well, one of the things it means is that I expect the best from my husband. I treat him like he's capable and competent instead of expecting like, oh, I don't know if I let him handle the cell phone plan, how's that going to turn out? Right? right. So that was a big one. And then every time I was offering those helpful suggestions, you know, helpful in wife language is actually pretty disrespectful mm -hmm. in husband language. It doesn't mean that, you know, I don't have good ideas and I can't contribute. Of course I can. And I do. But sometimes my husband is just doing something. He doesn't always need my opinion. My opinion is very important to me, but not always to him. What a concept. I know. <laughs> you know, you may talk about the duct tape. I, for me, I actually on repeat in my head, I'm like, he is a grown ass man. Grown ass man. So if he has pretzels for lunch or whatever it is, it would not go over well if he was like, that's what you're having for lunch. Like he wouldn't even you dream know. of it. <laughs> And so when I hear myself sometimes, and it's not necessarily about lunch, but just in that type of general way, I'm like, oh my gosh, you would not put up with this for a minute. Why are you acting like this crazy person? That's such a good point, isn't it? I can hear myself saying things and you think like, wow, yeah, this would not, I'd be making rude gestures to him right now if he was saying this to me. Yeah. And it's also, it's kind of a mother energy too, right? Which is men are not sexually attracted to their mothers. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> but that's who we remind them of when we're telling them what to eat for lunch or that they need to buy new underwear. We're buying their new underwear or making their doctor's appointments, right? All these things that we consider like I'm being a good wife. I'm, I'm helping him. We can be that smother mother, which, and, and the role I really want to have is his lover. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be his mother. So if I show up as her, I call her the goddess of fun and light. I love that. <laughs> Love's a good time, right? Yeah. Like that's who we fell in love with. I was, you know, smiling and laughing and singing and dancing when mm -hmm. he fell for me. Then I got all serious about like the mortgage and the car maintenance and stuff. And he's like, what, what happened? It's kind of funny because I think we think that after marriage, they change in my case, at least. And a lot of, a lot of my students we're the ones who, where things got kind of heavy or yeah. after kids, especially, right? That can be really challenging as well. So it's just been amazing to see how much women really are the keepers of the relationship. And as a metaphor, the way we're built, like our bodies 
are receptive. And so when we bring that receptivity, even like his trying to make you laugh, right? He's Mm -hmm. trying to make you laugh. If you laugh at his jokes, he loves that. He feels successful. He's going to try to make you laugh. You know, if you receive his gifts graciously, I used to take things back to the mm-hmm. store, right? Well, he stopped getting me gifts. He can, he can, you know, he wasn't feeling very yeah. successful. If there. he's not going to please you, what's the point? What's the point? Or yeah. he'd offer to help and I'd be like, no, I can do it. Right. That independent woman again, right. Rejecting. So he wasn't feeling like he could make a contribution. And I, I love this metaphor. There's a, this comparative religions student taught me this about how, when they study the yin and yang, right. Which mm-hmm. you can kind of loosely say are yin is feminine, yang is masculine. Mm-hmm. And the coffee cup, let's say it's made of ceramic, the yang is the structure, the ceramic part. And the yin is the part that can receive the coffee. So if you think about not being able to put coffee in a coffee cup, there's no receptivity there. What's the point of having a coffee? You know, the coffee cup has no purpose. And I love that as a metaphor for our relationships. They're there to to delight us, to make us happy, to unburden us, to comfort us. They, They feel like that's their... That's what they want to do. And if we let them, it's a wonderful, virtuous cycle. Mm. Yeah, it's it's such a good point. Do you ever bring like love languages into your work or, you know, because one of the things I grew up, my mom died when I was three and my dad was remarried pretty quickly. But my mom was known as this amazing cook and my older siblings who are, you know, 15, 14 years older, they carried on that. And so making a meal this is what we're taught, right? Men, like the way to their hearts is through their stomach. Like I do not have that man. <laughs> so <laughs> I've discovered over the, you know, the past several years that my love languages are like the, the oils changed in my car, or there's a little gift. And it's not about money. It's about like the thought, right? Flowers, whatever it is. He's all about quality time, spending time together, you know, holding hands, just being in that same space. And I'm not asking to dive into the whole love languages book, but what happens when your quote unquote love languages just don't necessarily match? So one of the things that's interesting is that when you fall in love with your man, right, your love languages are fine. There's not not an issue there, right? There's no problem. And I just know for me, like the love languages, it just wasn't enough. And I think part of it was Right. I was so attracted to kept falling for that illusion. Like if only he would change, then I could be happy. Mm. And so for me, that was, that's what the love languages were. It's like, oh, if he would just use my love language. <laughs> right. Fine. Why Done. don't you just do that? <laughs> yeah. Right. So there could be a little bit of a trap there, right? Just in terms of, or kind of like you're mentioning the rules girls earlier and there's sort of this aura of manipulation, right? Like I'm going to give to get, I'm going to pretend I'm busy on Saturday night or whatever to, to get him to chase me. Mm. The authenticity, right? For me, I just really value being just myself. I don't think I'd be able to memorize all the, the rules, (laughs) right? To to be successful at it. And they weren't either, by the way, the rules, ladies both got, they got their men and then they got divorced. So right. there, that wasn't a real success story from my point of view. So for me, a lot of things were about really, I call it staying on my paper, mm. which is where all my decisions happen, my attitude, you know, what I have for lunch and how, you know, what time I go to bed and, you know, just all the things that are up to me. And then there's like my husband's paper too. And every second that I'm focused on his paper is time that my life is going by without Mm. anyone paying attention to it. And what was an interesting illustration to me, I look back, it's like the minute I got off of his paper and started really paying attention to mine, I got to write a New York Times bestselling book, scary as heck. Congratulations. I got to go on national TV. Thank you. Yeah. And I did live speaking for the first time. All this was terrifying. I thought, well, no wonder I wanted to be the armchair quarterback of his life. Mm. That is so much less scary, requires so much less courage than showing up for mine, which was yeah. waiting for me. That is so beautiful. And I have to say, I'm so pleased and relieved that it's all about showing up as your authentic self. This is not about manipulation. You know, this is not about be this so he loves you or be this. Focus on your own paper. I love this. That it's such a perfect analogy. Yeah. When you are focused, we're all more appealing, right? When we're doing our own thing, like 
think about anyone in your life and you and you watch them and they're just on their course and they're doing their thing. And it doesn't mean you can't be a great partner and be a great parent, but when you have things that you're passionate about and that mean something to you, it makes you that much more appealing just in general. It does. Passion is such an attractive quality. Mm-hmm. And I really didn't enjoy being around myself when I was shrieking and nagging. Yes. Like I didn't even really appreciate my own company. So these are all the qualities that I've cultivated as a result of, gosh, you know, not having an escape from my marriage that wasn't too embarrassing for me to withstand. It's really been a gift. It's like, I would have never walked through that door marked self-examination and self-improvement if I hadn't been so desperate. So now I'm, I'm grateful. It's made me more vulnerable and soft. It's, mm-hmm. it's made me less shrieky, more calm. <laughs> That's made me uh, more confident and so has feeling loved every day. I mean, we all need to be seen and heard and understood. And just having a steady diet of that, that alone has been so, so worthwhile. Right. It sounds to me like self-love is the road and that just so happens to lead to a better love with your partner. It's about becoming aligned with who you truly are. And that alone is going to help you in many relationships, first and foremost, your romantic ones. It's absolutely true. And and learning and practicing the intimacy skills has just been the most valuable thing because it's like kind of like the old song, it's learning to love and be loved in return. But you're absolutely right that every relationship benefits. Like my relationship with my dad is so much better now because it was the only thing I knew. <laughs> Maybe I didn't think it would work so much, but I just didn't know what else you could do was complaining about what I didn't like. I just remember saying to my husband, John, like, you know, John, this kitchen is a disaster. And I thought he was going to jump up and start cleaning it. <laughs> Never happened. Never happened. Right. So, and I kind of have this theory now that probably all he could hear was like, John, wah, 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 wah. Yeah. Charlie Brown's teacher. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then I finally learned and I call it expressing my desires in a way that inspires. So it's a little formula that I use that I use it constantly now with everyone. And it's, I would love is the first part. And then you say the final outcome. Mm. So it's not about who does it or how it gets done, but it's just about the thing you want. So I, I finally, I said, I would love a clean kitchen. And do you know, my husband did jump up and start doing, he he said, okay, I'll do them. And he did. And that was like 20 years ago. And he's been doing them ever since. I don't do the dishes at my house. He does. And he keeps like the sink perfectly clean now and stuff. Anyway, So it's just amazing that when we're coming from love instead of from complaint, other people are attracted to whatever that that it's a form of leadership in a way, Mm -hmm. right? Like these are the, this is the outcome I would love. I I would love to go on a beach vacation, right? Could be one. There's actually a really sad story from before I learned this, which is uh, my husband took me to Hawaii before we got married. I'm uh, so excited on the first day I'm thinking, okay, we're going to go to the beach because we're in Hawaii. So of course that's what you would do. But instead of saying what I wanted, I said, oh, what, what do you want to do today? And he goes, well, let's go see a volcano. I was like, oh, a volcano. Like, <laughs> all right. But it's like, he's my newish boyfriend. I just want to be close. I don't want there to be conflict. So I'm not going to say what I want, right? I just, I'm going along with this. So we get in the car and I'm starting to get upset because like he didn't, he didn't even ask what I wanted to do, right? So and he, know, he knows something's wrong. He was like, this you know, is there anything okay? Is something wrong? And I go, do you think this is funny? Because I don't think it's funny at all. You're stupid. And I didn't want it to go with you. But I didn't want to go to the beach. You didn't ask me what I wanted to do. So he saw the volcano all right. <laughs> you were the volcano. I was the volcano. <laughs> and do you know, even after I behaved so badly and gave myself a terrible emotional hangover, he took me to the beach because mm-hmm. then he knew what I wanted. Right. So... But did I learn at that time? No, I did not. He still married me, which is kind of weird. Um, <laughs> brave, brave man. Brave man, right? I feel sad, right? When I think about that younger version of myself, I had just no concept. Uh, if you can't say what you want, you're never going to get what you want. But we're programmed often as women to not put our needs first. And so I think there are a lot of women who didn't have the ability at that age to say, you know what I would love is to go to the beach. And then we get resentful and you can only hold that in for so long. 
That's right. It's going to come out sideways. Yeah. So yeah. In, in many ways, it wasn't your fault. It certainly wasn't his fault, but it wasn't your fault either because you weren't given the tools to actually show up and ask for what you want. I can't say that enough for women. We do that, right? We play the martyr for so long and then we're so pissed off that we're the martyr. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Guess who just did that to yourself, woman? Exactly. No, but I love how you're saying that because that is so true. Like, I'm so many women, I think when their relationships are struggling, they feel so hopeless and so burdened and so resentful. And that my message is, gosh, no one ever taught you intimacy skills. There's these six magical intimacy skills. And once you learn, I mean, imagine trying to make an omelet. No one's ever taught you, right? You're just going to end up with weird eggs or something. (laughs) So this is, it's the same thing. It's not your fault. Mm -hmm. It's really not. It's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. Yeah. Right. That's the great mystery of life is is so many things like that. We're, it's like learning to play saxophone on stage, right? We're just trying to figure it out while we're in the middle of it from all the relationships I get to witness their progress. There's just nothing better than a a relationship, a marriage or any relationship, really. There's no better way to practice and cultivate becoming your best self. That's Mm -hmm. exactly what ends up happening. You become more respectful and vulnerable and fun and light from trying to have a great relationship. Yeah, I love that. So give us one more intimacy tip. Okay. So my, one of my very favorite ones is the power of the spouse fulfilling prophecy. Mm. And I learned this from Lee Miltier, actually, who taught a class like way back on Nightingale Conant on how she was teaching auto suggestion, which is just repeating to yourself, like I have a successful business or I ran a marathon or whatever it is you want to accomplish. And so a student in her class left the course and thought, you know, I've been auto suggesting the wrong thing to my husband. He always loses his temper and that's what I've been saying to him, but it's not the experience I want to have. So she decided out of this course, she was going to change up her messaging. And she just thought as an experiment, what do I got to lose? I'm going to start saying, that's not like you to lose your temper. Mm. So she went home, she waited for him to lose his temper. She didn't have to wait very long. And then she said, that's not like you to lose your temper. And he looked at her funny, like, what are you, what are you talking about? But he didn't say anything, but their 12 year old son said, yes, it is mom. He always loses his temper because who had he been listening to, right? He's Mm -hmm. in this dynamic, but she decided to just stick to her guns. So she kept saying this for a little while and it wasn't very long before they were at a restaurant and uh, the service was really slow. So the husband was starting to fume. He's like, I have a good mind to call the manager over here and tell him how long we've been waiting. And then he stopped himself and he said, that's not like me to lose my temper, is it? And she just nearly fell on the floor. She couldn't believe how quickly it worked. Mm. So I heard this story and I thought, you know, I'm doing the same thing. I started out saying, you know, maybe you could try to get a raise or maybe you could try to get a better job where you make a little more money. And the subtext, of course, is you don't make enough money. And that's what he heard again and again. And so my husband stopped making any money. He quit his job. He wasn't working. No money. This is how good I am at manifesting (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but it's all of us, not just me, right? So I decided to change it up. I decided I was going to start saying, you've always been a good provider. And I also, for fun, I just started calling him Mr. Moneybags. Because why not? <laughs> and so I started saying this too and finding evidence for it too, right? Not just saying the words, but sort of, right. you know, collecting the, the proof. And do you know, at that time, he started uh, his own business. He'd never started his own business before, but he did. And he was more successful with that business than he'd ever been at his previous jobs. And it became like absolute fact that he was a very good provider. We could get a big check in the mail and I'd go, oh, look, Mr. Moneybags has a big check and take me out to sushi or whatever. I would love to have sushi. And um, <laughs> Same. <laughs> yeah. So right, I got this experience of having so much power to have my husband show up the way I wanted him to and so the way I didn't want based on my focus and the power of what I was speaking into him. Right. It's amazing because there's a lot of personal development out there that basically is how you talk to yourself, right? If you want to launch a new business or you want to lose weight or whatever it is, being in that and seeing the power within you, we never think like, oh, do that for other women or do that for your children. But I don't think there's enough out there that talks about how you speak to your spouse, how you can empower them as well. I like that you're doing this work because I feel like we're missing the boat in many ways that it's such a no brainer. 
Like I'm sitting here like, well, duh. I mean, if you're, if it works for yourself, right, where you focus, where your energy goes, it grows. Yeah. Why would that not work in a marriage when the energy is positive? Like, of, of course it would. Of course. You know, I always think of myself as like my husband's wife mirror and he's my, you know, he's my husband mirror. And we're really getting a reflection of what we're bringing to the party. Yeah. So when I was showing up resentful and bitter and martyr, you know, that when I got back was a distancing, you know, I felt lonely and rejected. Mm -hmm. And then when I started bringing respect and gratitude, of course, he can't get enough of me now. Right. <laughs> so have, and some fun. days you're like, be careful what you wish for. Exactly. That's right. Like, I'm trying to work here. <laughs> Do you have to sit right next to me? <laughs> so, no, right. But I love it. I mean, yeah. Of I also may relate to that statement. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Love you, honey. Yeah, I love you, honey. But... <laughs> so one thing that you were doing that you do on your podcast, you have a worst relationship advice segment. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. I do. I, gosh, I take such delight and a, a perverse <laughs> delight. And, and it's because partly because I really felt like I suffered. I was really trying to fix my marriage. I really did put a lot of effort, the wrong effort, unfortunately. And so much of what I read is the things I was trying. And I know now that I know how to fix it, because uh, I've done it, that doesn't work. And when it, so one of the ones that is like recurring in many different forms and seems to get this award all the time is the I statements. Are you familiar mm -hmm. with I statements, Jackie? I think a lot yeah, of us like are. Yeah, like I feel as opposed, yeah, as opposed right. to you. Right, right. Exactly. So, but the problem was with all the I statement examples that I see, and maybe who knows what the original intent of I statements were. Maybe this is uh, not quite the right uh, original interpretation of it. But all the I statements say things like, when you left me, you know, when you left while my mother was here, I felt abandoned, right? And so, so it's technically an I statement, but you're saying like, you left, you abandoned me, right? Like whose paper are you really on there? Where's right. the feeling? I, abandon's not a feeling. We have, you know, there's mad, sad, bad, glad, and afraid. And that's about it, really. Mm -hmm. All the other feelings are kind of extrapolations of that. So that it just never worked to say anything uh, to my husband that was critical about what he did. But if I could get down to that vulnerability, right? If I could get down to the, like, oh, I, I felt I felt lonely without you when my mother was here, you know, something like that. Mm. Now there's that softness that you were talking about earlier. So anyway, I'm frequently giving the I statements, the worst relationship advice of the week award. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that makes sense. Cause we're like, I feel that you're not pulling your weight. Like that's, that's not right. really, yeah. that's not a feeling. <laughs> that's you saying I feel and then any damn thing you want. After right. That, exactly. Right? We're using it as a way to just twist it. Right. Versus what you really wanted and that is for that person to be with you when your mother is here for whatever reason. It could be exactly. very difficult. <laughs> but, Why you would want that, we don't know. Yeah. But that, that's amazing. And, and it goes both ways too, that if my husband said something like that, I always want to be there for him. And so if I heard the words, or even my kids, if my kids were like, I missed you. Yeah. Yeah. That would be on your paper. Right. Instead of being on his paper about what he didn't do or... Exactly. And and you're only going to cause defensiveness, right? Usually when you are pointing and I'm pointing my pointy finger like this at him. I'm not being authentic. I'm not I'm not really showing up. Yeah. Well, I love this. Like I said, I was ready to take a trip back to 1970. I thought we were going to have to wear pearls and heels and do all this. You know? I know, right? <laughs> but in actuality, this is an invitation to be our most authentic selves and stay on our own paper and do the work on ourselves and for ourselves. And that can only um, benefit every relationship you have around you. Right. It really does. And then, and then you also get something that I value highly, which is a rock solid marriage where I, I feel loved every day. And yeah, I feel, you know, he makes bedroom eyes at me. And there's just like, there's a, a lot that went missing that I got back that I always dreamed of. I mean, there's still part of me that wanted to be that Disney princess. And, mm. and now I am. And that <laughs> it was, it was so worthwhile. <laughs> Not only do you have that, but you also have the best selling book and you have, yeah. you know, the passion outside that only makes the passion within the relationship that much greater. Yeah, it's really true. And now, and I also have out of this created a community of 
like-minded women, women who are trained in accountability and gratitude and respect. And they are just the most delightful women to be around. That's, that's who's on our campus all the time. And how brilliant is that? to actually make women happier in your business. So then you get to be around happy women. <laughs> it's like, you know, so many people have these businesses and they're, they're bringing people in who are stuck and unhappy and unfulfilled and all of that. And then that can only like bleed into the whole group. It's well, it's true. I, I mean, I would say a lot of us started out stuck and unhappy, that's but they're we, willing to do the work. I they're would think. willing. That's, and that's the magic part. I mean, there are so many women who will never find the accountability or the humility, right. To say, you know what, maybe, maybe I have a little bit to do with why this marriage is broken. Yeah. Um, but the ones who do are just, they're my people. Yeah. That's my tribe that I love to be around. That's amazing. Of course, I'm going to link to the books and the podcast and all that stuff in the show notes. What's the best way for them to take step one into your work? Well, I've got something really fun going on right now, which is the Adored Wife Roadmap. And it's a free PDF. You can download it at my website, lauradoyle.org. And it not only lays out the six steps to creating a, a peaceful, passionate, playful relationship without his conscious effort, it also covers through the three top mistakes that I see so many women making, all of us, including me, in trying to get your husband's time, attention, and affection. Mm. So it really lays out, you know, what not to do and gives you the steps to do to become the adored wife that we, I think most of us want to be. Yeah. All right. And that's free. And that's right on your website, lauradoyle.org. Right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Laura. This has been fun. So much fun, Jackie. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. We keep the conversation going in our free and private Facebook group. So make sure you join us over there. Also, if you have any questions, comments, wishes, hopes, dreams of something you'd like to hear on 40 Thrive, send us an email at hello at 40thrive.com. Until next time, take care and keep thriving. Spring has sprung. And with the change of seasons, sometimes comes an increase in vitality. If you're feeling in the mood for a little more personal time, may I suggest Coconut. Coconut is all about providing clean and natural ingredients when you're enjoying your most intimate moments with or without a partner. Naturally safe products developed by people who are obsessed with quality. Get 15% off with promo code GROWNASS at grownasswoman.guide forward slash Coconut. That's 15% off with promo code GROWNASS at grownasswoman.guide forward slash coconut.